Hello, um, I'm Martin LaMonica. I'm the projects editor at The Conversation, and I'm excited to welcome you to this webinar to mark the publication of our book called The Conversation on Water. Uh, the Conversation is a nonprofit online publication written by academic experts and edited by journalists for a general reader. We publish about 10 articles a day on a wide range of topics, and our content is republished regularly in other media. Everyone from big media outlets like CNN to small regional newspapers. We just launched uh, a line of books called Critical Conversations, which is published by Johns Hopkins University Press. Each chapter is a previously published article on our website, and the articles are organized along different themes to give readers a foundational knowledge of a given subject in a very accessible way. In addition to the conversation on water, which I have to show you, it's a fun book and a really nice read. We also have books on gender diversity, biotechnology, guns, and one on work, which is in development. So um, with this webinar, we want to share some insights from some of the contributors to the book uh, on water. Water is a subject that's very deeply intertwined with many issues. It's about uh, environment, of course, uh, but it's also about policy and politics, social justice, health, and the economy. So. For today's discussion, we discuss, uh, we've assembled a panel of experts from very different disciplines to help give you a more holistic picture of water issues and potential solutions. We will have a panel with three contributors to the conversation on water, uh, with, uh, moderated by water journalist Brett Walton from Circle of Blue. If you have questions, submit them in the Q&A, not in the chat, and I will send them to Brett uh, uh, during the panel. Uh, but first, we will hear a short introduction from Andrew K. Gerlach, who was the guest editor who I worked with uh, putting this book together. She's a professor in the School of Geography, Development, and Environment at the University of Arizona, where she also directs the Udall Center for Studies in Public Policy. Andrea, over to you. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you, Martin. Good afternoon. It's a real honor to be part of this book, this publication, and then also to be part of this conversation with all of you here today. I begin the preface of the book by saying we have taken water for granted in the United States. And by that, I really mean that we've come to expect and rely on water to flow freely from our taps, clean and at a low cost. The U.S. has been home, at least historically, to some of the most reliable and safest drinking water in the world. And so it's really easy to get complacent and even out of touch with our water. But the last decade has really been a bit of a wake up call for us in the United States. Starting with the Flint water crisis, we really, it really helped to raise national concerns about the management of our water systems and the overall safety of our drinking water. COVID called further attention to issues of access and affordability in many communities in the United States. I've been a student of water, how we govern it and the politics around water for more than two decades now as a university researcher and professor. And in doing this, I've had the pleasure of meeting with policymakers in cities across the US and in our nation's capital to understand how we make policies around water and then how they work in practice. And I've had the privilege to meet with scientists working to understand the latest pollutants in our water or studying the performance of different practices like green infrastructure. And I've learned from community members about the struggles that they face with access to affordable clean water and how they're working to build sustainable water efficient homes and more resilient neighborhoods. It's heartening to see the significant growth in knowledge of how we manage water. We're coming to better understand the scope of the challenges ahead and what lies in front of us. But the statistics are pretty sobering. One quarter of Americans receive water that violates federal drinking water laws. Two million Americans are without running water and indoor plumbing. Leaky pipes in cities across the US from Atlanta to Cleveland to Pittsburgh are losing upwards of 30% of their water. 45%, almost half of parents with school-aged children worry about the safety of the tap water in their children's schools. Water is unaffordable for one out of 10 US households. And non-white households in the United States are disproportionately affected by water utility disconnections, water debt, and a lack of indoor water plumbing. These statistics can help us to see that there are many dimensions to water, or there are many pathways into seeing and learning about water. Water can be seen as an economic issue, an environmental one, or a spiritual one, just as Martin told us at the start of this webinar. And in, this, in, the, the, in the 
stories in this book, the chapters in this book really elucidate how water is deeply interconnected, how our water is intrinsically tied to our food, our energy, our health, and our biodiversity. Given this interconnectedness, we need, of course, innovative solutions and technologies to meet the challenges ahead, but we also need better governance and policy mechanisms that are collaborative, participatory, and equitable and just. I can see this in action here in the Colorado River Basin where I live. It's been a bit of a living laboratory these days as cities, agriculture communities, and tribes face drought and shortage. They're coming to learn how their decisions impact one another, how they're interrelated, and how they're linked. Here in the southwestern United States, like the rest of the US, this interconnectedness of water must really be reflected in our decision making and in our governance. Water is just really too important to be left to the experts. The issues around surrounding water today should not be confined to narrow spaces, seen merely as a technical issue, and with decisions made by limited participants. I'm really pleased to hand it over to Brett Walton now. He is an award-winning journalist with Circle of Blue, a nonprofit news agency that reports on water. Brett is really the go-to person for all things water. I start my day with a cup of coffee and reading the latest news. He's gonna facilitate a conversation now with three panelists who are authors of different chapters in the book. And hopefully it will help us to start to further unravel these notions of interconnectedness and the different dimensions of water and also help us to look for opportunities and solution spaces ahead. So turning it over to you, Brett. Thank you, Andrea, and thanks to the conversation for hosting this rather timely and important event on water in the U.S. with the launch of the conversation's book on water. Uh, we do have three of the authors of pieces in the book here with us today, knowledgeable guides that will help us uh, understand some of the answers, solutions, implications of these big questions around water in the U.S. Uh, I do want to you know, say that uh, you know, Andrea started her her talk with 2014 and Flint and this growing awareness of water in the U.S. And I can attest in, in my career, I have definitely seen more attention and more focus on water. And part of that is from scholarly work and part of that is attention in the media. But also it's, it's a factor of these things are affecting people's lives in really dramatic ways. So we'll get into some of that today with our panelists. The way this will work, you're probably familiar with this sort of setup. Uh, I will introduce each of the panelists and they will have a few minutes to um, give an overview of the piece that they wrote for the conversation, their, their topic of interest. And these topics span a broad range. We have uh, indigenous water rights, farming and law, health and climate change. And then in the conversation, we will mix and match and have a nice discussion where all of these issues will be intertwined and we'll take some uh, listener questions at the end. And like Martin said, you can submit those uh, through the Q&A and uh, I will pose those at the end of our discussion. To lead us off, we have uh, Rosalind Lapierre. She's an award-winning indigenous writer, environmental historian, and ethnobotanist. She's also a professor of history at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, and Rosalind, just a, a question to prompt you in the, uh, the recent years we have seen uh, photos of water protectors holding signs, uh, water is life, water is sacred. And besides being a, a very nice placeholder on a, a sign, uh, I hope you could tell us a bit more what that means, those concepts mean um, from an indigenous perspective. Yeah, thanks for... Well, first of all, thanks to the conversation for having this webinar and thanks for them for creating the book series, which is really excellent. Um, and uh, I've already read several of the chapters uh, that are in the book uh, that uh, one of my pieces is in. Um, and yes, I, one of the reasons why I was interested in even writing a piece uh, initially um, on why water is sacred to indigenous people was to help sort of explain um, uh, that question of, uh, the placards that people were seeing, especially after, or I mean, during and then after um, the Standing Rock, um, uh, uh, Standing Rock uh, protests uh, in 2016, 2017. Um, and I was initially contacted by journalists who were, you know, calling me up and saying, hey, Roz, can you explain some of this? And then um, luckily I was uh, contacted by an editor from the conversations like, hey, Roz, why don't you write something <laughs> to help explain some of this? 
Um, and so one of the things I've tried to do in several of the pieces that I've written for the conversation is to help explain um, just ideas about religion, religious practice, um, religious expression of indigenous peoples and the natural world. Um, so not just with water, but with other things as well. And I think that um, it's um, important to recognize um, from the beginning that uh, many indigenous um, communities uh, in the United States and elsewhere around the world um, are religious people um, and sometimes very religious people. And so religion is a lens through which they see and operate uh, within their daily lives. And every indigenous community is different. And so um, in the piece um, and pieces that I've written um, for the conversation, I've tried to give specific examples from different tribes and tribal communities to say, to kind of ex express some of that difference. Um, and um, for myself, you know, I uh, grew up on the Blackfeet Reservation. I was raised primarily Blackfeet, which is my mother's tribe. I'm also Métis, which is my father's um, uh, indigenous community. Um, and so in the pieces that I've written, I've also tried to share what I have learned myself from my own family, from my own community about that idea of why water is sacred to indigenous people. Um, that didn't, doesn't exactly uh, answer your question, but that's a starting point to just say that there is a wide diversity kind of of understanding about um, water uh, as viewed through a religious lens um, by indigenous people. Um, I guess the other thing I would just add at the very end here is just to for folks to remember when we are talking about um, not just water, but just sort of cultural life in general that um, you know, one of the places that does a lot of research on kind of religion and religious practice is the Pew Charitable Trust. And one of the things that they've found kind of year after year with their research is that in the United States, at least, most people um, uh, say that they are religious, right? Uh, all manner of religions. Um, and so we often have to, we often, I will just say this, we, in the scholarly world and in the academy, we often forget that people are religious, they view things through a religious lens, and that is definitely true for indigenous communities um, and tribal communities here in the United States. All right. so, thank Thanks, Raz. We will get into some of the implications of that uh, different perspective on water here when we get to the discussion. Uh, next, we have Bert Griggs. He's a professor of law at Washburn University, and his scholarship explores the historical, technical, and cultural aspects of natural resources law, especially water law. Uh, so, Burke, here we have one of the, the fundamental bedrock issues in the U.S., and that's law, particularly around water law, who gets to use and control and have access to water. I think you wrote about this in the context of farming in the Midwest. So how do those access rights and legal obligations affect water use there? Uh, thank you, Brett. And I want to acknowledge my uh, co-authors, Matt Sanderson and Jacob Klugschertz, because they're sociologists. And I think one of the strengths of the conversation series is its interdisciplinarity. What I do in this piece is combine a legal and a sociological approach to the largely invisible and very worrisome crisis of the depletion of our country's groundwater systems. Every year across the Ogallala Aquifer, we pump out about 8 million acre feet uh, that never comes back. And to put that in reference, that's more than half of the annual flow of the Colorado River. We're pumping so much groundwater out of the planet right now uh, that there's an article yesterday uh, in geophysical research letters that uh, showed how that groundwater pumping has changed the way the earth is rotating. So it is a massive problem that is not as visible, but is extremely worrisome. Agriculture uses anywhere between 80 and 95% of the water that, uh, that exists in the West. Rivers are just the icing on the cake of groundwater aquifers and of snow storage and reservoir storage. <clears throat> and our article's thesis is in the title, uh, we're pumping too much groundwater because so much of government policy pays farmers to do that. Farmers are not breaking the law. They have property rights to pump this water. The fundamental problem, Brett 
alluded to is since the 1850s and especially since the 1950s, we've granted more water rights to pump and to divert than the water systems can support. <clears throat> so that's a sort of bureaucratic problem. It's called overappropriation. There's also a problem in farm policy. Ever since the 1970s, when agricultural secretaries famously said, go big or go home, win the Cold War on agriculture, for agriculture, we've seen the size of farms increase and get bigger and bigger. And Matt Sanderson has identified what he calls the production treadmill, that in order to make money and keep property, farmers have to continually borrow to add acreage, either as owners or as tenants. And that in turn encourages them to pump more water to meet their bank loans and to meet their other financial commitments. So if we are not breaking the law, farmers are not stealing water. If these subsidy systems promote overproduction and overpumping, what are we supposed to do? Well, a common thing you may know, if you're interested enough water to tune into this podcast, this webinar, is <clears throat> you may think that subsidies are just a terrible thing. You may be an environmentalist who sees how subsidies distort and destroy ecosystems. You may be a more libertarian person who does not like government support and sees subsidies as distorting economic systems. But the fact of the life is subsidies are an important part of production agriculture. And so our position at the federal and state level is to try and reform <clears throat> two things, the subsidy system and the property rights system for water. And we think both of these are possible. First thing is to reform the, the subsidy system by instead of rewarding overproduction, instead of making a fetish out of grain yields, we should focus on conservation. We should pay farmers to not irrigate in sensitive areas, to, to not irrigate during years they don't need to. I don't think farmers are necessarily concerned about where these subsidy supports come from as long as they've got a secure supply of them upon which they can plan their businesses. But that's federal. The state law system is critical because most water rights are state rights. And here we propose to make water rights more flexible, that farmers gonna be willing to trade less water use over the long term for more flexible water use year to year. Most water rights have an annual limit. And if you allow more variability there, then I think that gets us a long way. Water conservation can happen, but as the bad guy here is the lawyer who uh, somewhat punctures a lot of dreams, I want to conclude by saying you've got to understand water reform within the context of property rights. And that's not bad news because property is a very creative tool. Markets can be very creative tools. And I think there are a lot of ways we can go here. Thank you. So, thanks, Burke, and we'll get into that the details of those sorts of changes in legal systems here in a bit. But first, we want to turn to Gabriel Filippelli, our third panelist today. He's a biogeochemist with training in climate change, exposure science, and environmental health. He's a professor of earth uh, sciences and the executive director of Indiana University's Environmental Resilience Institute. Uh, Gabe. Here we are at the beginning of summer, you know, a weekend from the solstice, more or less. And this is the time of year when people are out in the water. Uh, usually those are fun times, but in some places that have harmful algal blooms, it can be quite uh, dangerous. So I think you're writing about some of the dangers of harmful algal blooms and things people should be aware of when it comes to water and heat and climate change and health. Well, uh, thank you for that. And you know, it's interesting you referred earlier to 2014. 2014 was a wake up call for water security in the US. Uh, two things happened, uh, which sort of shook our foundations, our sense of security about water. And they occurred within 300 miles of each other. Uh, first, there's a Flint water crisis, uh, which uh, was caused by a, a change in water chemistry supply uh, and the, 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 the 
impact of that was obviously a generation of lead poisoned kids from that. Uh, and the second one was a massive Toledo, uh, a massive harmful algal bloom that shut down the entire water system in Toledo, Ohio for, uh, for several days. Now, uh, the, the Flint water crisis is a, a remnant of the fact that we have a lot of aging infrastructure in the United States, uh, including about 10 million households which get their water delivered in, uh, in lead service lines. So that affects something also like 400,000 uh, schools and childcare centers. So I, I wrote uh, one of the pieces was about the uh, the infrastructure uh, the infrastructure bill uh, legislation, the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, which included funds to find where these lead service lines are and replace them. The challenge is we don't actually know where they are, uh, so uh, it's it's taking some some significant modeling to figure that out. We know how to replace them, but we don't necessarily know how they are, where they are. But that speaks to a, a lurking uh, hazard uh, uh, in many cities throughout the U.S., especially older cities. Now, the, the, the Toledo crisis was of a different character, and it shows the fact that, uh, that we, our water systems are not particularly resilient. In uh, Toledo, Ohio in 2014, uh, a massive harmful algal bloom uh, likely triggered by climate change and, uh, and related runoff in that area occurred right over the only water intake line for the Toledo, Ohio uh, water system. And so that meant that they had to issue a rare warning, uh, not only a, a do not drink, but a do not drink, do not boil warning because uh, these harmful algal blooms uh, produce a, a toxin which gets even worse if they're boiled. Uh, so uh, it, it showed that a lot of our water systems are not particularly resilient. And, and why aren't they resilient? Well, we built them for 1920. Well, actually, we haven't built them for today or tomorrow. And so uh, I explore a little bit, and a lot of scholars are thinking through, uh, what are the challenges in, in water security in a lot of parts of the US? In the Midwestern part around the Great Lakes is largely uh, these prolonged episodes of uh, flooding and drought. Uh, flooding causes the uh, uh, the redistribution of, of harmful algal blooms, as well as redistribution of, of pathogens in waterways um, like E. coli, which are very harmful for contacting. Uh, but of course, drought also causes its own stress on water supplies. So it's key that both of these issues, Flint, Michigan and Toledo, Ohio, revolve around this issue of, of infrastructure and the need to actually take it very seriously. It unfortunately is still the case that a lot of infrastructure to handle water uh, is, is built based on our understanding of water today. So these massive sewer stormwater upgrades that we see in a lot of cities are, are built to hold the capacity of rainfall today. Uh, when in fact in the Midwest, our, our extreme precipitation events are coming uh, fast and furious. An example here in Indianapolis, we're uh, mostly through a $2 billion upgrade. Uh, but unfortunately, that's even worse. We built it for the, the extreme rainfall events that we had in the year 2000. Uh, here we are in 2023, and we already have about 15% more extreme rainfall events, and we'll have another 15% more by 2050. So rather than relying only on gray infrastructure, you know, tubes and tunnels and pipes to protect and secure our water systems and our safety, actually, we have to also think about the role that green infrastructure can play. So nature-based solutions can play in augmenting some of those solutions. And we also have to think not how do we build to the capacity of today, but how do we manage our, our, our life, our water in the year 2050 or beyond, because a lot of these very large infrastructure projects uh, will and should last until then. Uh, so it's, it's almost a, a call to, to believe the climate models when it comes to water. They're, they're true, they're real. They've actually borne out in real life. Uh, and so we can start making some of our decisions that are more informed by the science uh, and less informed by uh, simply a, a blind look at today's world and assuming uh, that our climate change uh, future will be the same. Thanks, Gabe. Well, everyone who's spoken so far has mentioned uh, that today's world is different regarding water than it was 10 years ago. There's been change in perspectives. There's been change in climate 
you know, conditions are, are different than they were in 2013. Uh, so I'm wondering from each of your different views on this, uh, how you have seen those changes uh, play out in, say, management or law or infrastructure health. I'll start with, with Rosalind. Uh, we had discussed earlier that there is more attention being paid to tribal management and tribal participation, not just in being at the table, but actually being able to make the decisions around water. Uh, and that might be a little more complicated than it seems on the surface. So can you discuss a bit this the movement towards more tribal involvement in water management? Yeah, so as I say, I, I think the lawyer should be answering this question, but <laughs> I'll try my best. Um, no, I, I, I think it's something that um, because we have a new administration, um, in the White House, oh, not not so new at this point, but um, uh, new uh, in terms of um, that there is uh, indigenous leadership. Um, so, for example, um, Deb Holland, who's the Secretary of the Interior, um, I know has been working um, with tribes across the United States to um, strengthen where they can um, those uh, issues around water, water management, um, and um, also. Um, uh, clean water. Um, and then also um, kind of connected um, is um, we also have a uh, uh, indigenous uh, person who is now the head of the National Park Service. And I know that's going to sound a little bit um, like why the National Park Service, but at least out here in the West, um, there are several national parks that are at the headwaters um, of uh, many of uh, the water uh, that we use. Um, throughout um, the Western um, water system. So even here, I'm in the state of Montana right now. I'm originally from Montana, even though I work in Illinois. Um, and so we have two major national parks, Glacier National Park and Yellowstone National Park. Both are headwaters um, parks. And so they are places where the water starts and then it you know, heads out to these agricultural areas that have been mentioned already. Um, and again, I, 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 I'm from an area where definitely agriculture is the major um, uh, economic force uh, in, in the region. And so water uh, it is definitely um, extremely important to, uh, to agriculture here, not just in Montana, but across the West. And so there is kind of this connection between tribes um, these headwater, the water in the mountains and headwater places like, again, national parks um, and leadership at the national level. Um, so over at least the past few years, um, there's been definitely a much more conversation about strengthening um, the uh, strengthening the kind of in, a, a different kind of infrastructure, um, jurisdictional infrastructure uh, of uh, tribal communities. Um, and water. Not to get too much into the nitty gritty, but out here in Montana, there have been, and out in the West, um, there have been several what are called water compacts. Um, and again, I'll have the attorney explain what that means. But there have been several compacts that have been signed between um, tribes, the state, and the federal government over um, how to, how, um, how to collaborate with each other um, over how to um, use um, water out here in the West, because um, for the most part, tribes have kind of more jurisdiction over water, but states use more water than tribes do. So I think I'm going to end there. It gets it gets very um, complicated, um, but I'll just say that because there is a new administration um, in the White House, new leadership, there's definitely much more of an understanding and a focus, thinking about how to strengthen, um, again, infrastructure, different kind of kind of jurisdictional infrastructure with tribes and tribal communities when it comes to water um, and water rights. Part of that, I'll end by saying this, part of that occurred in this last 10 years because there has been much more of um, what we've seen in the media, but a lot more activism um, by tribal communities um, people kind of, you know, your everyday people out in the streets, but then also tr um, uh, tribal governments to try and um, strengthen um, uh, tribal rights when it comes to water, especially out here in the West. 
And this is you know, front page news recently. There was a Supreme Court decision last week uh, ruling against the Navajo Nation. And I'll bring Burke Griggs Absolutely. in here to maybe uh, explain just a bit about that and what it means in the broader context of changing uh, how the Colorado River is managed in the coming decades. Well, uh, I'm glad we have five hours uh, to describe and explain the Colorado River Basin. I told the lawyer uh, here to keep the the okay the the addendums and the nuance. I will. Uh, I, I think it boils down to one word, and that's sovereignty. When we negotiated the Colorado River Compact in 1922, we completely left the tribes out of it. There are 39 tribes, recognized tribes in the basin. There are more tribal communities than that. And so tribes get their allocations of water from the state allocations that were agreed to either in 1922 or a subsequent compact for the upper basin, uh, Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Wyoming or through a Supreme Court decision in 1963 between Arizona and California. Trapped in this morass is the Navajo Nation, one of the most powerful, sophisticated, and most organized tribes in the United States. They have been repeatedly and for decades trying to get their water. Now, tribes hold their water rights under federal law most water rights are issued under state law. So there are complicated jurisdictional problems about how a federal tribe, which owns its reservation in a trust relationship with the United States, obtains water rights that are recognized under state law. So one of the ways that Roslyn just referred to uh, to deal with this is through the mechanism of an interstate compact. And Montana has done this beautifully. They have signed interstate treaties or compacts involving the United States, the state of Montana, and the tribe. And then those compacts become federal law through the compact clause once, the, once the Congress votes it in as a statute. The Navajo have not been so lucky. Last week, the, the Supreme Court ruled that the treaty obligations the United States owed to the Navajo were not specific enough to require the United States to develop and identify the water supplies for the tribe. This is very disappointing for two reasons. One, the chronic racism and subordination of tribal interests to state interests. Secondly, we have a Bureau of Reclamation, a Department of Interior, that's led by the first Native American woman to lead the agency. But the United States was against the tribe here. And that speaks to some of the structural disincentives that prevent the tribe from accessing waters it has been legally entitled to access since at least 1908. So I would encourage you to read Justice Gorsuch's dissent in that case. You can find it online at supremecourt.gov. <clears throat> and he emphasizes that the whole point of putting someone and putting a tribe on a permanent homeland implied in that is the obligation to provide water. And the Navajo tribe, as he famously wrote, well, it's already famous among water law circles. The tribe has been trying to do this since Elvis appeared on the Ed Sullivan show. So the silver lining probably is that this case is gonna make it very hard for state courts to keep the Navajo and other tribes from stronger assertions of water rights. But again, the jurisdictional issue here is quite tricky because under federal law, the United States can be brought in to a state court water rights proceeding. It's called an adjudication where all of these rights are recognized. But some of these can be quite long. For example, there's one in Andrea's uh, backyard in the Gila River adjudication that's been going on for 40 years and they think it's about halfway done. Uh, that is no way to run any sort of quiet title operation. So the Navajo are justifiably very frustrated. One final thing though is under federal law, tribal water rights do not expire. They do, they're not subject to the use it or lose it rule. What that means is tribes are developing 
and asserting their power to market their water rights to non-Indian communities that need them. And uh, a tribe in Arizona recently executed a $100 million contract to supply water to non-Indian communities. So I think we are seeing the emergence and the exercise of tribal sovereign power within the context of the other two sovereigns, the United States and the states. While I have you here, one follow up, you spoke about the need for reform in the, the property rights, water rights arena. Um, there have been cases made that the current water rights system developed in westward expansion is colonialist and racist. What would a more fair uh, modernization of water rights look like? Is that even possible under without throwing the whole thing out? I think it's very difficult, Brett, for a couple of reasons. Most Western states for both surface and groundwater follow what's called the prior appropriation doctrine, uh, which means that first in time is first in right. Uh, Brett's 1930 water right trumps my 1990 water right. And if Roslyn's there on the Blackfeet reservation, that's a 19th century water right. That would be older than either of ours. That is not a bad system. And let me explain why. You can buy and sell and move water rights. And when you buy an old water right, that priority moves with the right. So if the city of Las Vegas needs more water, it can purchase an 1890 or 1880 water right and then move that water right, move that place of use to the city of Las Vegas. Um, uh, if you get rid of the priority system, Brad, you'll be getting rid of the most valuable stick in the property rights bundle. We could do that, but it would be sort of like getting rid of fracking. We could do that, but in the process, we'd have to purchase the property rights that we want to eliminate. So there are some very strong federal and state constitutional protections protecting the priority system. Courts from Montana to Idaho to Arizona repeatedly assert that if you don't protect the priority of a water right, you are effectively taking that right. So I think the way we can think about making a water rights allocation more just or equitable is to try and bring in more and more participants to the system. Unfortunately, many people are not able to purchase water rights and dedicate them to the use they would like to. Many water supplies are limited only to agriculture or to municipal and industrial supplies. Imagine if the Sierra Club or the Center for Biological Diversity or the Walton Foundation, very wealthy philanthropic foundation, very interested in the Colorado River, could purchase 500,000 acre feet of water rights and allocate them to wetlands. We are seeing more of that, but in terms of remedying past injustices, I think that may be a place where the United States or states would have the political authority to use their power of the purse to redistribute some of these things. All right, and we may come back to that later, but I wanna bring uh, Gabe Filippelli in here um, and go back to this discussion we had about the change in, um, and attention and change in perspective around water in the US. Uh, we saw the infrastructure bill last year, which you've written about, or two years ago. Uh, and do you think that the health impacts, um, people seeing how water, bad water, polluted water uh, has affected health, has changed the way we look at water systems in the US? Yeah. I do actually, and, and I think that two things happen and actually touched on both of our chapters in the last 10 years. One is that of course, Flint, Michigan was not the first time that uh, one of these events occurred. It occurred in Washington, DC in 2002. It occurred last year in, in uh, Newark, New Jersey. Uh, these failures of drinking water systems um, are, are bound to happen uh, because we have uh, dangerous, dangerous pipes in our in our ground uh, that are delivers water to kids. I think that the um, 
if, if Flint, Michigan had just been a blip uh, that had been dealt with quickly by the proper authorities, uh, we probably wouldn't be talking about it as much. But instead, it was a one-year debacle of a, of a, of a thriller uh, that was uncovered by a pediatrician who was seeing a skyrocketing number of cases in her practice of lead poisoning in kids. And of course, there's all kinds of governmental malfeasance behind that and suppression of information. So it almost dramatized that event. But the ripple effect is that even right here in my state of Indiana, our very conservative state legislature passed unanimously a bill to expand its drinking water testing to include um, all child care uh, child care centers and uh, and schools around the state. So it's events like that can truly change uh, the dialogue. So that doesn't even that doesn't even um, note or acknowledge the infrastructure bill. It's actually just public awareness, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the the other uh, issue that's come up with water, in my opinion, at least, is uh, you might be able to guess what the 10 hottest years on in recorded history have been if you look at a calendar of the last 10 years. Yes, they've all been in the last decade. And so we are seeing climate change just rearing its ugly head and wreaking havoc on, uh, on precipitation and lack of precipitation throughout this country and throughout the world when one third of the Pakistani population is underwater as it was this year, it's a, it, it, it is a wake up call. So I think we are becoming increasingly aware of how vulnerable our, our infrastructure is. Mm -hmm. And I think increasingly armed with real solutions, right? So yeah. there are solutions to deal with some of these things. Uh, the, the lead in water pipes is, a, is an easy one. You find them and replace them. It's expensive, but you do it. Uh, the overflowing uh, uh, storm sewers and harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie, well, you build resilience into a system. Uh, and ultimately, hopefully, you curb climate change. Because what we're seeing now, our planet now, is going to be, is already different than it was 10 years ago. And it will be significantly different 10 years and 20 years from now. I'm well, hoping you can expand a bit on that. So we look at lead as one of these legacy issues where the infrastructure we put in place 50, 100 years ago is causing and has caused uh, severe problems throughout its life course. And we just remove those pipes. That's the the means of um, improvement. But for, say, climate change, when we're looking ahead at challenges that are down the road, what steps can municipalities, cities, governments, individuals even um, take to prepare themselves or their communities for uh, climate threats through water to health? Uh, yes, it's excellent. As much of our work in the Environmental Resilience Institute it revolves around that, that very issue is um, there have to be people that are working actively to stop us emitting carbon, which is the cause of climate change, right? But similarly, there have to be people working with, uh, with communities and with organizations to help them grapple with climate change that is already here and will continue to worsen. And so a lot of our work recognizes the fact that a lot of communities have no resources to, to apply the best science we have on climate change to make informed decisions today about what their infrastructure will be able to withstand in 10 years or 20 years. And a perfect example is if you're a small time city manager uh, who's considering, well, do I, do I uh, build a new, a new pipe system for stormwater uh, runoff or do I expand my, my well field uh, for drinking water supplies? Uh, they are just considering today. We built some tools that people can use uh, uh, like a dashboard that helps them actually consider what this is going to be like in 10 years and 20 years, because I guarantee you those investments uh, will either be excellent ideas 20 years from now or terrible ideas 20 years from now, right? Lead pipe ends up to be a terrible idea, uh, as was lead and gasoline and lead and paint, right? Uh, and, you know, hindsight is lovely and all, but we're trying to arm communities with that, that, that power of hindsight which is, uh, which is present in currently available uh, models, uh, models for precipitation, for example. So helping to prevent um, bad decisions from being made in the first place. Cool. Um, so something that uh, everyone has touched on that it's one of the 
gorillas in the country for water policy is farming and some of the problems that farming causes. Uh, we've heard about groundwater depletion, which is happening in the Ogallala Aquifer, the Central Valley in California and rural Arizona, even in Arkansas. Um, so it's across the country that aquifers are being depleted for, for uh, food production and fiber production. Uh, and then nutrient runoff, as Gabriel talked about, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus contributing to harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie and the Gulf of Mexico, California in the lakes, San Francisco Bay. Uh, so these are problems that uh, are national. And I guess the big question here is how do you address farming and the problems it causes with water quality and water quality depletion? I'm, I'm going to actually put Burke right on the spot on that one, because <laughs> a lot of that revolves around our, our farm bill, right? Our, the federal protections that it provides to farmers, particularly in the area of, of agrochemicals and uh, guarantees of, of prices and, and uh, promotion of corn-based ethanol. Uh, it, has, it has been written, you know, I'm no expert, but it seems to have been written uh, for and by the corn and bean producers in the U.S., um, and we are a victim of that. So we're seeing unsustainable water use, uh, uh, profligate applications of fertilizers, um, and and all of it is to the to the detriment of a lot of the environment around those areas. This is another one of those areas that could be a five to ten hour seminar, and. Uh... I told Burke that we would bring the farm bill up because it is uh, farm bill season in Congress, the new farm bill, which governs subsidies and not only subsidies to farmers, but also um, SNAP program, uh, food benefits for the poor. Uh, a big piece of legislation is uh, up for negotiation this year. So uh, Burke, how does the farm bill affect your say average American and your farm water connection? I think there are two pieces of federal legislation that you have to think about at the same time. The first one is the Clean Water Act. <clears throat> uh, the Clean Water Act has been an ex extraordinary success in cleaning up many of our uh, nation's rivers and streams, but it never would have passed Congress in the early 1970s without major exceptions for agriculture. Uh, farm state senators, thanks to the filibuster and even just simple Senate majorities, uh, insisted upon substantial exceptions. So for example, uh, the runoff of water that you put on a field through irrigation soaks up all sorts of chemicals that Gabriel just mentioned. Also a lot of geogenic chemicals like uh, you know, selenium or even uranium. And because of that, uh, Congress passed an exception in the Federal Clean Water Act saying that the return flows from irrigated agriculture are exempt from the Clean Water Act permitting system. And I wanna put that in the foreground for the viewers today because there is a lot of heat and smoke about the waters of the United States controversy. We had a big WOTUS decision two weeks ago from the Supreme Court, which uh, effectively solidified the very uh, uh, minimal uh, Justice Scalia standard for what constitutes the water of the United States. But the fundamental problem in the Clean Water Act are these statutes. They're not how the agency interprets what the regulations are or the regulations that the agency puts forth. This is why agriculture has become the top polluter of water in the country. It's largely because a lot of other industrial polluters have cleaned up their act through the permitting systems of the Clean Water Act. Now, in terms of the Farm Bill, that's the other side. If you think about the Clean Water Act, uh, bringing the hammer of regulation, the, uh, the Farm Bill brings two things, um, agricultural subsidies, commodity price supports, tax breaks, all sorts of things, along with the supp Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. <clears throat> Rural poverty is a real deal. When Lyndon Johnson, through his political genius, fused food stamps with farm bills in the 1960s, that was seen as this brilliant urban-rural uh, combination. And what we've seen since then is, in many ways, rural poverty has gotten worse. 
But there are hints of hope in the farm bill in terms of adjusting price supports to better uses of water. The Conservation Reserve Program pays farmers, flat out subsidy of course, but to use less water or to retire land from irrigation. Uh, another innovation has to do with crop insurance. 10 years ago, in order to collect your crop insurance, if you had federal crop insurance and the drought blew out your crops, you had to prove that you had fully irrigated your crop, which led to some of the more heartrending things you could see across the Great Plains. It's October, growing season's over, the crops have failed, but you see the center pivots running 24 seven so that they can pump their full water right so they can collect on their federal crop insurance. <clears throat> federal crop insurance is starting to turn around into more of a partial crop insurance situation. And we, we have other things in the farm bill we could go into, but I think with this administration, there is a very, I think, middle of the road approach to developing pragmatic, practical subsidy packages that will achieve water conservation aims without reducing um, the, the subsidies that farmers get. Some things are out of our control. And one of these is the incredible increase in the size of the average American farm and the decrease in the percentage of the American working public that works on farms. I think both of these need to be more recognized. If we are working in a democratic system, I think we do need to recognize that, you know, the farm community in terms of people who actually grow crops is at least 10 times smaller than it was a generation and a half ago. Yeah, it does not take many people these days to farm 15,000 acre wheat fields in Kansas. You need like five people and that's all it takes. Uh, so we're going to get to audience uh, questions here in a second, but I want to you know, wrap up here the dialogue portion with um, solutions, and we've talked about solutions throughout this conversation. Some of them are you know, large ship, property rights, water law, things that take a while to turn. And I'm wondering if uh, you know uh, in your respective fields of something that perhaps is overlooked uh, a solution could be to a big problem, could be to a smaller problem um, that may be low hanging fruit or just needs uh, a wider audience uh, for it to be implemented. It's something that could be applicable in Florida or in California, national or local, uh, but something that you think would be a positive benefit for water broadly. Well, I can jump in here for just a moment. So, I mean, I think that one of the things that tribes have been thinking about, um, first of all, again, thinking about the diversity of indigenous communities and how of indigenous religion and religious practice, you know, there are um, certain tribes that think of particular waterways, whether it's a river, perhaps a lake, um, or even the underground aquifers as something that is, um, part of the supernatural realm or the divine. And so there are some tribes where there's an effort to protect certain places um, because certain waterways, because it is a sacred place to them. That has the benefit of then protecting that water as well um, for other people. Um, there are some cases that have gone all the way to the Supreme Court um, you know, a, a case from way back when was the Taos Blue, um, uh, Taos Blue Lake uh, case um, where the Taos tribe literally spent almost an entire century fighting for the Blue Lake uh, in, in New Mexico um, because it was um, a place that was sacred to them. It was a sacred site um, and they wanted to protect um, not just the lake, but the watershed of the lake as well. So long story short, um, they were able um, to be able to protect that particular site. Um, other tribes today are, are trying different efforts that are both um, within the federal legal system, but also within tribal systems as well, um, where tribes are setting aside places um, that uh, they view as uh, sacred 
um, again, whether it's a, a river or, uh, or a lake or, uh, or other kind of um, um, water system, um, and are di using different uh, apparatuses today. So one, for example, is the idea of um, personhood status and applying personhood status to particular um, natural entities, um, such as rivers. This has been done in other parts of the world. Um, it's beginning to uh, be used here in the United States as well, mostly now just within tribal communities, but also sort of the discussion is in, is in other places like off reservation communities as well. So there's different ways that tribes are thinking more creatively, but again, it's connected back to their own religious expression. Um, the reason why they're doing this is not necessarily to protect water so that it's not polluted, um, so that it's not um, uh, being used, it really is because of religion. And so um, oftentimes we have to think about that and sort of separate out sort of how do we use water, right, in America versus how do we revere water in America as well. And so tribes are thinking um, creatively about how to work within the system that we have. Um, and again, Bert can probably say more about this than I because of all of the different cases that have occurred, especially more recently about how tribes are trying to work within the system um, because the system does not, um, surprisingly, the United States system does not really protect sacred sites or sacred places. You have to use a different kind of legal apparatus to say why you're setting aside a place. Oftentimes that becomes an environmental thing or some, some other um, legal way to sort of set aside um, those lands. But for tribes themselves, the reason why they want to set aside, again, a particular river or, or, or a, 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 a lake or some sort of um, um, a, a waterway is because of religion um, and, um, and because they may view a particular river or place as sacred to them. So they'll end there. All right. Yeah, so a different, different uh, view on how water should be managed. Um, we're going to go rapid fire here with solutions. Uh, Burke, minute. Um, I would urge us to do two things. Take the communities that we've recognized now, uh, the tribal communities, uh, state communities, the federal government, environmental communities, religious communities that aren't tribal, and think about what it means to be a water public. Most people who live in San Francisco or LA have never been to the Central Valley. Most people who live in Kansas City have never been to Western Kansas. Kansas is one of the most urbanized states in the union in terms of its percentage of population. Most Texans have not been to where we irrigate cotton. We have a lot more Americans who vote and are concerned about water than we do who use the lion's share of the water supplies. We need to reconnect the American public with the water supplies upon which that public depends. If we can do that, and Brett's work does that, I want to compliment you on your journalism. If we can do that, then we can correct many of the distortions that are allowing the misuse and the pollution of our nation's waters. All right, and Gabe? Well, uh, I would say the same things I always say about climate change. You need to talk about it and you need to vote for it, right? So much like uh, climate change, you you know, you can significantly impact the trajectory of a system by the power of your vote and the power of your voice. So the more you learn about it, for example, by buying this book, uh, the more you can, you feel like you understand the situation and you're able to act on it. You care about it. Cool. All right. Well, let's move to a couple audience questions. Um, sorry if I mispronounced the names, but Nancy Phillips Burgess ask, and this is a question applicable to the Western US because there are many of these proposed, but she asks, can you discuss legal ethical concerns and ramifications of large companies wholesale shipping of water from rural aquifers to large cities? So these have been proposed in New Mexico and Colorado and Utah. Um, and it happened all the time back in the day. Cities went farther out for water, tapped watersheds that were hundreds of miles away. But still today, there are groundwater proposals in the West to move water from rural to urban. And legal ethical concerns or, or any ramifications there? Yes. <laughs> um, but again, I, I want to emphasize two things. Water rights are property. 
that their property is subject to really intense regulation. And if the people want to put limits on how much water can be moved and uh, the conditions under which that water can be moved, limitations, uh, they've done so. Um, <clears throat> so if you are looking at this from the viewpoint of a, an agricultural community, whether it's in Eastern Colorado or, or Northern New Mexico or Southern Colorado, <clears throat> This is a problem we call buy and dry. The water leaves the rural community to supply growing urban and suburban development, destroys the tax base and the economic productivity of the local ag community. But we have willing sellers, okay? The, the, the owners of this farmland with the water rights are selling that, okay? The states and the communities are not coming in and condemning those water rights. That would be politically suicidal. So I think one of the ways you can think about these large scale water transfers from, from rural to urban areas is think about these rural publics. A very few number of the people in the rural community may actually own the water rights. Look at the Central Valley of California and the San Joaquin. That's a serious, serious oligarchy when it comes to water. And the same could be said for uh, the San Luis Valley uh, in Colorado. So that's a problem. On the other hand, you've got to acknowledge the economics of it. Um, agriculture is not a hugely profitable uh, industry. If you can move a, even a small water rate uh, to a more economically valuable use, such as to use for microchips or for municipal water supplies, then that same amount of water is generating a lot more economic activity. And that's where I think we need to start paying attention to economically marginal agriculture, um, especially the way in which certain crops are grown in the wrong places. Uh, we should grow corn in Gabriel State of Indiana. That's where corn was born to be grown. It should not be grown in Western Kansas where we get 16 inches of rain a year. So there are all sorts of judgments going on here. And I, I will close the, the particular question with something to keep in mind. Water, a water rights only recognized as a legal right if it's applied to a quote, beneficial use. But our understanding of what a beneficial use is evolves over time. 130 years ago, leaving water in the stream was a terrible waste of water. You should use all of that for irrigation. But now we know that there are a bunch of millionaires in Roslyn's home state of Montana who will pay millions of dollars to pay farmers to stop pumping water for their fields and leave the water in the stream so that they can fly fish. So our culture and what we view as a legitimate use of water is changing and the movement of water from rural to urban areas is part of that legitimacy puzzle. All right, we have a, another question here on some of those changes and how we're changing our relationship to uh, the natural world. I'm combining two questions here from Mary Hayden and Mikhail Gorgio about nature-based solutions. So using uh, nature to hold water, uh, to do some things to benefit cities. Uh, and so the, the question here is, how do you hold water on the watershed to prevent flooding while also incorporating you know, health and socioeconomic benefits with these nature-based solutions? So I guess with uh, Gabriel, perhaps, you know, how are you looking at nature-based solutions as a remedy for resilience? Yeah, so right now, the non-nature-based solution uh, that we see in a lot of cities is, for example, stormwater goes straight into rivers and streams when the stormwater capacity is exceeded of the sewer system, much like in my city of Indianapolis. And almost all those stormwater discharges are in uh, low-income communities, low communities of color, right? So it's currently set up in such a way that it's completely inequitable. Uh, what we've been working on with this green infrastructure is is um, having things like sacrificial wetlands within a, a particularly vulnerable sub watersheds, right? Where you are actually letting land not be developed or you're taking it out of development 
so that that can either be a natural recharge zone for groundwater that Burke is talking about, or it can actually be flood protection. Um, the challenge there is if you're a city, would you rather, you know, uh, expand your tax base by putting up another Walmart downtown uh, and making people happy because they can shop? Or are you going to leave that 150 acres to a sacrificial wetland? Well, that becomes a real challenge. So that requires cities to consider the environmental uh, benefits of, some, of, of water uh, when they're considered zoning and when they consider tax abatements and tax credits for development. Did you have something, Rosalind, or? Okay. Uh, another big picture question here, um, and you can you know, interpret this how you will, but is it reasonable for us to think we can reach sustainable water usage levels given our population projections and in what time frame? Um, so here, sustainable, I'll just preface this by saying you can look at sustainable nationally, or you can look at sustainable by watershed or by city and what they currently have. So let's take this at a city level, because I think this is where the question's going. Um, Western cities, Eastern cities, how do, how do cities become sustainable in their water use? Sounds like a Gabriel question, but I'll come after you. Okay. Um one of them is that um, we, we simply, we have two issues uh, in, 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 in dense, densely populated areas like cities is that um, we use water stupidly and we a lot of it leaks out of our water supply system, right? Andrea mentioned that, the tremendous percentage of water, perfectly clean, safe drinking water, which leaks out into, a, a, there's a whole nother hydrology on this underneath cities that you don't even see. That's water leaking out of uh, water systems. Some of that um, leakage is designed so that you want you don't want bacteria coming in water supplies. You always want a little bit of it leaking out, but 30%? No, that's crazy. Uh, and the other is um, the, the so thinking of, think about farming on the neighborhood scale, the amount of water that is used on household lawns, the amount of farm chemical or chemicals that are used on household lawns uh, is just absolutely unsustainable. And and it's a question of rethinking what we consider landscaping. My own campus is is as much of a of a offender of that as any. They they want to have this beautiful campus with lots of green space and some trees so people can see this impressive campus, just like you're in Cambridge or something. Well, um, if we were in a wet in the West, I guarantee you there are similar campuses like mine there where that water's precious. It ends up, as Burke said, we usually had get too much water. That's actually usually our problem. Uh, but there's a lot of situations where, um, you know, uh, yeah, so my answer is yes, there's enough water to 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 provide water for 331 million Americans. That's not the issue. It's how we use it as the issue. I'll take the moderator's prerogative to interject here a number. Uh, lawns in the Western U.S. can use half or more of a city's water supply. So you see water use spike up in the summer when people are watering their lawns. So there is a lot of water there, it's how we choose to use it, is the big question. Uh, and, and Brett, we've yeah. seen in the Colorado, we've seen some cities in this space and do a much better job with that, right? Las Vegas with kind of banning non-functional non lawns, doing it through subsidies, but then also through regulation. My own city in Tucson is tackling it as well. And the campus that I'm at, the University of Arizona, really prides itself on kind of desert landscaping, that zero scaping, you know, kind of rocks and, you know, drip irrigation and native landscaping. But it took a long time because, you know, there really is this psychology that a campus looks green and has, you know, certain kinds of flowers and that sort of thing. So it really does take a, a mindset and then a big policy mix to kind of help move people forward. Right. Thanks, Andrea. Arizona representative there. Uh, we're coming towards the end. There's, I guess, two questions I want to combine here to make sure people have a chance to answer. We've kind of addressed most of this question, um, so I'll put two here. The first question is, what does a good water system look like regarding security, reliability, and climate change for the future? Is anyone getting this right? So I guess there, if you can think of a, a highlight, a city to highlight that might be doing better than others in, in these terms. And the other goes back to a response that Burke gave about, you know, democratization of water. And someone in Arizona uh, is concerned about expansion of 
uh, dairy in southern Arizona and wonders how the people, in quotes, her quotes, um, can accumulate more power to make sure there's a stable water supply when some of these decisions are made at high uh, levels of government. So any city that's doing well and you know how do how do the people get the power in the water? It sounds like Tucson is doing well. <laughs> well, every you know I I've studied cities around the world and in the US and I think at the end of the day there is no like perfect city that it's doing everything right, but there are little examples or experiments in cities. So globally since the pandemic we've seen South Africa do this like really big you know, investment at the city scale around water access and sanitation. Singapore has been doing a lot with reusing, so reusing all of their water supply. It's been imperfect, but we've seen some pretty good developments in Australia in First Nations actually um, achieving their appropriate water allocations and um, through kind of more of a legal process. In the U.S., Tucson has been an award winner with green infrastructure and actually seeing stormwater like as a resource. And Los Angeles, too, I think they announced one of your stories, maybe in Circle of Blue, but Los Angeles recently announced that, I don't know, in the coming decade, you know, the majority of their drinking water will come from stormwater, capturing stormwater, treating it and using it for potable water supply. And then other cities have been good at recognizing equity concerns like Philadelphia and Baltimore, really kind of seeing these trends with homes being repossessed by banks for people, you know, not paying water bills, being delinquent in water bills and really changing those, you know, municipal ordinances to make water available, like in efforts to make water available for the poor, these kind of sliding scales, minimum access to certain quanti quantities of water. So I feel like it's more like there are shining moments here and there, but there's not kind of this perfect package or perfect city. Let me jump in. I want to give some kudos. I grew up in Denver, so my sympathies on the Colorado River are with the upper basin. Um, Several of the fastest growing states in the country are uh, Utah, Colorado, to a lesser extent, Wyoming and New Mexico. But those four states um, <clears throat> have ballooned in population and have ballooned in uh, their economic productivity over the last 50 years without increasing their water use. This was the sort of thing that uh, is not necessarily as acknowledged uh, across the Colorado River Basin, that many of the crises we're seeing in the Colorado are lower Colorado River Basin crises. They're Arizona and California problems. I'm not trying to get the upper basin off the hook here, but it shows you that cities like Las Vegas or Salt Lake or Denver have done a lot in terms of graduated water bills. Use a little water, the water's cheap. Use a lot of water, the water gets really expensive really fast. In terms of dairies in Arizona and alfalfa and the Central Valley, that's a really naughty problem. And K-N-O-T-T-Y. It might be an N-A-U-G-H-T-Y problem too. Um, and one thing I would, I think, offer to that questioner is, we used to have dairies in cities. We used to have meatpacking plants in cities. I grew up in Denver. You could smell the Ralston Purina plant. Where's that? It's right by I-25 and I-70, just south of the stockyards. But federal environmental law, of which I'm a big fan, pushed a lot of these polluting ag industries to really dry, really rural areas. So an urbanite can just out of sight, out of mind, open up the refrigerator, not think about where the electricity came from, the milk or the meat. We need to try and reintegrate our food systems with our civic systems. And I think if we do that, we'll scrutinize these dairy operations a lot more. There is a, there's no real desire to look too closely into big ag right now for fear of what we might find. All right, I think we have to leave it there. We've run up against the time. Uh, I think the conversation could have a conversation series on any one of these 55 topics we discussed today, have a whole year of it. But yeah. We'll let Martin and other, others uh, determine that. But yeah, we'll get, Martin, we'll get the uh, the closing. Yeah, no, thank you so much, uh, Brett and Rosalind and, and, and Burke and Gabriel and 
and uh, Andrea, this has really been a great discussion. Um, I feel like I really learned a lot. Um, so and I, I think we got a really good view of um, not just how kind of complicated water is. I, I think we maybe knew that, but just got to, I, I have a much better grounding in all the kind of the, the, the different social and economic and legal and health issues that are, that are, uh, that, that are just part of uh, solving these problems. So it, it was really wonderful discussion. And I hope all the attendees kind of got some good ideas um, and got a greater awareness of water, um, how it works in our society and what a you know precious resource it is. So um, to answer everyone's questions, yeah, we'll post this on our we'll post this on our uh, YouTube uh, site. We should be able to do that within a few days. Um, Lisa is now sharing links to um, our our website, our donation page. Um, we are a nonprofit after all, and um, also the uh, the site for uh, for the book. Um, I really want to thank um, attendees for sure for coming, and but really want to thank you. Uh, all the panelists and uh, Brett for really leaving a really interesting and important discussion. So um, with that, we'll finish up and um, everyone have a great day. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right, I guess we're done. See you guys. That was great. Great job, Brad. Nice to see you. Let's talk sometime. Oh, uh, of course. All right. And good to meet everyone Thank else. Thank you, everyone. That was amazing. Bye. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.